Good morning to everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Great to see you today in the Lord's house here at Benham. And trust that you're excited about being here, looking forward to a wonderful blessing from the Lord. Appreciate those that are visiting with us in the service this morning. And always good to see you whenever we come together. Appreciate those that will join us later by way of YouTube and share the message with us. And I trust that every heart will be blessed in a wonderful, wonderful way. Looking for, uh, forward to the choir singing and to you singing as a congregation and just uh, pray that the Lord will be honored through all that we do. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your abundant blessings. Your mercies are fresh and new every morning. As the scripture reminds us of whenever we read it, and we're thankful for those wonderful mercies. Thank you for your love and kindness throughout each and every day as you provide for us and give us the strength that we need for living our lives. Please bless each one that's come this way this morning. We are grateful to have the privilege and the opportunity to come. I trust that you will be honored through all that is done. May every song that's sung and everything that's said and done give you praise, honor, and glory because you are worthy. These things we humbly pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Oh, 
smiles this morning. It's so good to see. I've missed your smiling faces. I haven't been able to be here for a couple of weeks, but I'm certainly glad to be back with you today. So I have a question for you this morning. How many of you like books? Nobody? Nobody likes books? I know we've got some over here that love books and have to buy a new book every time we go to Walmart. Every time we go to Walmart. <laughs> so you probably have a good book that you like, don't you? Is there one you can think of that might be your favorite? Maybe about animals. There's lots of books about animals. Or trucks. Do we like books about trucks? Or, nope, not getting anything this morning. Okay. That's all right, because I brought, look at these oldie goldies. Do any of you guys remember these? These were my favorite when I was little. So these are from my, when I was your age. They are very precious to me. They were some of my favorite books to read, especially this one that says colors are nice. That one was one of my favorite. And there's one that's not in here, and it was called Patches. And it was about a little dog that had patches put on him to fix his boo-boos. It was my favorite book, and it looked just like this. I'm going to have to find it. 
But anyway, these were my favorite books when I was growing up. And I loved all the stories, and I loved to listen to the stories, and I loved to, like, go through the pages before I could read and make up my own story. Do you do that? Make up your own stories? No? Not getting anything this morning. Okay. Well, you know, we have another really great story, and that's in this. You guys know what this book is, right? What is it? Can you at least give me that? The Bible. Bible. That's right. This is the Bible. Who's it about? God. That's right. 100% right, Ben. It's about God. This is all true stories, too. So some stories we read, they're made up, right? But this one, all true. Every word of it. Every story, every person, all true stories. And they all have meaning to us as Christians and those that love God. So this is a very important book that I want you to remember and to cherish. And as you get older, spend time reading. <clears throat> This has 66 books within it. Did you know that? That's a big number. I bet Emlyn has 66 books in her bookcase. That's how many books she probably has. But this little bitty book here has 66 books within it that contain lots of stories. So we want to delight ourselves in the Word. There's a Bible verse from Psalms 1, verse 2, that says, but his, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And what that means is, this is God's word. And he wants us to meditate or learn it and study it. <clears throat> so I want you to remember this book as you think about growing up and, and the books that mean the most to you. Okay? Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear God, we thank you so much for the word that you have given us in the form of the Bible and for what it means to us and for what truths it gives us. Be with us in the service this morning. Be with these children. Be with those that couldn't be with us today and help us to have a great week ahead. For it's in your precious name I pray. Amen. Thank you, Cheryl. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Appreciate our little folks being up here this morning as well. Trust that you have your Bible with you this morning, and I invite you to look at two passages of Scripture. Uh, they're both in the Old Testament. They're not very far apart. 2 Kings chapter 18. That's the one I'm going to read from in just a few minutes. But you might want to find... 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and hold your place there uh, because we'll be using that uh, passage for our benefit this morning. We're continuing with our series that we started at the first of the month, answering the question, why do many Christians lack personal power with God? We've already covered a couple of things this morning we're going to talk about the lack of dedication to God, the lack of dedication to God. Most of us would likely come to an agreement that in today's culture, there really is in great measure an absence of individual as well as collective dedication to God. History reveals that Israel, God's chosen people, uh, had that same problem time and time and time again. She would dedicate herself close to God and go forward for a while and then regress and then have to come back and revisit the idea of being dedicated to the Lord. When her dedication to God diminished, the results were always the same. She found that she lost her power for service, which also led to a loss of divine blessings from God in her life. And so it is with all of us. If we're not careful, we can lose our power for serving God. None of us want to do that because we know, or hopefully we know, 
that if we lose our power for service, then we're going to lose a lot of blessings that the Lord would otherwise bring our way and shower upon us. Our text verses or passages that we're going to look at this morning give us one example of a time when Israel experienced a tremendous renewal in her life. Uh, I'm going to read the account that is given to us in 2 Kings because it's a very brief account. But I'm going then to flip over to 2 Chronicles 29 and we will use the details that are given there because there are far more details given in 2 Chronicles 29 than what we have here in 2 Kings 18. So the reading is brief, starting with verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hosea, son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old was he, was he when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Quite a commendation that is given to him there in that passage, isn't it? Verse 4, he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it, and he called it Nehustan. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments which the Lord commanded Moses. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and served him not. That's the introductory bit of reading that we have for the account that we have much more detail of in 2 Chronicles chapter 29. I think it's wonderful that uh, God saw fit in his word to say of King Hezekiah, he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord. That's quite a commendation, um, doing what is right in the sight of the Lord. I'm not going to read the 36 verses that we have in 2 Chronicles 29, but what I am going to do is kind of give you a brief outline to go with the reading that we just looked at from 2 Kings chapter 18. Here's the background and a little bit of the detail that we have in 2 Chronicles 29. Israel, prior to Hezekiah, had a king who was very wicked, and you'll remember his name whenever I give it to you. I won't put you on the spot by asking you to tell me who it was, but I'll tell you who it was. His name was Ahaz. You remember the stories that the Bible records for us of Ahaz and Jezebel and how wicked they were. It was a very, very challenging time for Israel in those days and she went far away from God because the leadership over her was leading her away from God. But Hezekiah passed away and in his place a new king was named as we read about there in Kings and Hezekiah was his name. He inherited the throne and he was a man who had a very strong desire to want to please God. Thank God for those kind of people. Thank God for Hezekiah. So he did a number of things, among which included the fact that he reopened the doors of the house of the Lord, according to verse 3 of Second Chronicles 29. He called for the priests who were the servants there in the temple, and the sanctuary to sanctify themselves. He called for the house of God to be 
sanctified and to be cleansed in verses 5 and 15 of that chapter. And he warned that there be no negligence in what was done in verse 11. In other words, he was saying to the subjects under his rule, do everything the way it is supposed to be done. Do it right. Don't overlook anything at all. In my words, I would say don't even overlook a small detail, something that you might think is not important. Take care of it all. And he cautioned them about that. Upon completion of those tasks, as you read the story unfolding there in the chapter, the worship of God as commanded by God himself was reinstituted. This was different from what had occurred under Ahaz whenever he was the king. The kind of worship that God required was reestablished and reinstituted according to verses 20 through 30 of that passage. Verse 23 and verse 24 tells us that one of the things that was done, first of all, was the offering of a sin offering. That was very important. And following the offering of the sin offering, there was a burnt offering. That was necessary and that was God's order for those offerings. First came the sin offering. Second came the burnt offering. The sin offering, of course, was to atone for their sins. And the priest did the sacrificial exercise of performing that offering for all of the sins of Israel, all of the people, including the king, everyone. And then the burnt offering uh, was offered that indicated that now that their sins had been forgiven, I'm shortcutting all of this uh, to just give you some limited details here, but this offering represented that the people were fully rededicating themselves to the Lord and to His service. If you read the details there in verses 20 through 30 of this passage, it was quite a day. There were a lot of animals that had to be slain and flayed that particular day. And that burnt offering uh, had to burn so as to completely consume everything that was upon the altar that had been placed there. It, it took it all away. Uh, nothing was left once it was over. But its indication before God was very, very important, indicating that the people were dedicating themselves wholly and completely unto the Lord. We find in verse 31 then that Hezekiah commended the people for dedicating themselves to God. He recognized that that was the right thing uh, for them to do. And later he warned them again to be continually committed to yielding themselves to the Lord in order to experience His power in their lives and also for it to be transferred on down into their children so that they would experience the power of God in their lives as well. We find that in chapter 30, verses 7 through 9 of that chapter. Not only did the king rejoice to see the dedication of the people, but may I suggest to you this morning that God rejoiced also. It made God very, very happy. He was very pleased that the people were dedicating themselves afresh and anew unto Him. That's what He wanted. They were His chosen people. He had told them much earlier in the Scripture that that was the right thing for them to do. In Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse number 29, we find these words. Oh, that there were such an heart in them that they would fear me and keep all my commandments always that it might be well with them and with their children forever. God wanted it that way. And whenever he saw it occurring here, the sin offering being administered first, the burnt offering being administered indicating their full devotion and uh, dedication unto him, that's what he wanted. That's what he wanted whenever he spoke those words there in Deuteronomy. And it indeed had to be a very, very joyous time for the Lord. 
What do we need to glean from this then in terms of what we're looking at in our lessons today? Well, may I tell you, first of all, that the principles that are outlined in this story apply practically to every one of us in our lives today. God secondly desires the dedication that uh, was, is depicted here in this passage from every one of his children in this world today. I know circumstances are different. Boy, am I thankful. You've heard me say this before. Am I thankful that we don't have to offer bullocks and rams and goats and pigeons and turtle doves? And if you look at the numbers that are given there, I mean, it was a very, very intensive task of labor to do all that was done whenever those offerings were offered unto the Lord. But it pleased the Lord. Thankfully, we don't have to do that today, but God still does want the same level of dedication and commitment to Him that He expected back in those days. He hasn't changed at all. And so I can tell you thirdly that He loves to see a believer dedicate themselves fully and completely to Him and live for Him in that manner as long as there's breath in their being. However, I have to make a sad acknowledgement here this morning. And that acknowledgement is simply this. Many professing Christians exhibit dedication to almost everything in this world rather than God. Most professing Christians do that. I hope that's not true of us here at Benham. I want us to be folks who are dedicated to the Lord. So in order for us to increase our knowledge and our understanding, let's allow the Holy Spirit to challenge our heart uh, here this morning and our hearts together about this matter of dedication to God and why it ought to be a priority in our lives. And I'm not preaching something new to you. These are things that you probably already know, so let them be refreshers, if you will, and reminders. Let it be as if it were continuing education for us in the service of the Lord. You know, in many of the um, things that we do in life, we have to go for continuing education credits. So why shouldn't we as a Christian just continue our education in the Lord and let Him continue to speak to our hearts and renew our understanding and so forth. So let's let him do that here in our lives this morning. So I lead off with the individual points of the message today with a question. And that question is, what should dedication to God mean to a Christian? When those words are spoken, dedication to God, just three words, dedication to God, what do you think of? What do they mean to you? Well, I don't, uh, I'm not asking for you to give a testimonial of that. But rhetorically speaking, I want you to think about that. In your own mind right now, I want you to ask yourself, what does the words dedication to God really mean to me? Have I thought about it lately? Have I reflected on that? When was the last time that I reflected on that? Uh, What does it mean to me, just right off of the cuff, and the more I meditate on it, what does it become to mean to me as I get deeper into my thought processes about being dedicated to God? I would say unto us this morning that in its truest sense, every believer is to grow to realize that they are set apart to God for a sacred or solemn purpose purpose. Now we call that act of setting apart a big word. And that big word should not trip us up. It's the word sanctification. We're all sanctified and set apart unto the Lord when we are birthed into his family and we are saved by his wonderful and marvelous grace. We are set apart to serve the Lord. He wishes for us to right then and there 
completely, fully dedicate ourselves to Him and live our lives in the center of His will each and every day. There are some companion words that we can pick up to go with the word dedication. They include such words as to consecrate, to consecrate one, oneself. David on one occasion asked the children of Israel, and who then will consecrate himself this day unto the Lord? Who will really set himself apart and be fully dedicated to the Lord and give of his substance and so forth? for the service of the Lord and for the building of the temple of the Lord and so forth, as was upon his heart to do at that particular time. There's also another word, and that's the word devote. Devote is a companion word, or devotion. We get devotion from the word devote. More appropriately, though, we take these words and we can describe them in two more simple words. And those words would be these, wholehearted devotion. Consecration, devotion, but more appropriately, wholehearted devotion. That means with all of our being, we commit ourselves to being dedicated unto the Lord. And that's what happened here in this passage of Scripture under the leadership of Hezekiah with what was taking place in the story that we are looking at here. These people fully, wholeheartedly devoted themselves unto God, and that made the king happy, and he commended them for that, and it also made God happy as well. So practically speaking this morning, devotion or dedication to God means simply that one yields themselves consistently, day in and day out, to the purposes of God. They are yielded to be a vessel who serves God in the way that he wishes for them to do so. Question number two that I raise is simply this. What are the attributes of dedication that make the Lord happy? The attributes of dedication that please the Lord. Well, I'll give you some suggestions. You have them on your outline there. But God loves for our dedication to be voluntarily self-determined and intentional. In other words, what I mean by that is God wants you and me as his children after we are saved to internally determine that we're going to serve God no matter what. We're going to live for him. We're going to be dedicated to him And we're not going to allow ourselves to be drawn off course by the things that Satan would use to draw us off course. So we voluntarily, of our own volition, self-determine within ourselves, intentionally do we do that, that we are going to serve the Lord and be dedicated unto Him. I have told you many times before, The night that I surrendered to preach the gospel was the night that I fully and completely surrendered myself to the Lord. I was surrendered before then, but not like I became surrendered that night, 51 years ago now. That night, as God dealt with my heart, inside of me, I knew that I had a choice to make. And God unfolded before my eyes the results of both choices. I could choose to go forward and be blessed, or I could choose to not go forward and experience loss of blessings. And he made that very clear to me. I've told you my testimony. I continue to bring that back up to remind us as we deal with these kinds of lessons So that night as I stood there, I realized that it was a time that I myself had to voluntarily walk down the aisle and take my dad, who was the pastor of the church, by the hand. I had to do that in a self-determined, intentional way and say, Dad, God has convicted me 
of the need to fully surrender to preach the gospel, the unsearchable riches of his wonderful grace. God was pleased with that, and he's been pleased with it ever since. The second thing, the second attribute that pleases God is when we dedicate ourselves sacrificially unto him. Sometimes it is necessary for us to dedicate ourselves sacrificially unto the Lord. There's been many, many times in our years together, Rosalie and I have wanted to do things that we had to give up. Whether you like me calling them sacrifices or not, they were not like the offering of a ram or a bullock or whatever, but nevertheless, they were a personal sacrifice that we had to make. At that particular time, it was necessary for us to do that in order to continue to be obedient to the Lord and express and demonstrate full dedication to the Lord. I remember an occasion when a very, very dear friend of mine said to me, someone had passed away and we were getting ready to go on vacation, already had arrangements made to go on vacation. And I said, I can't go on vacation. My friend said, yes, you can. You go ahead and go and said, everything will be fine. I said, I can't do that because as the pastor of that individual, I must be here and I must help the family, pray with them and help in the funeral, conduct the funeral and so forth. And after that's done, then if we have time, we'll go on vacation. Many times have we done that in, over the 51 years. Whether you call that a sacrifice or not, it was for us at that particular time. It was for our girls, Cynthia and Cheryl, as they were growing up. When there were times that I had to leave them, such as one Christmas night, I remember how snowy it was, but I was needed at the funeral home. And I had to leave the, uh, the entire family that Christmas Eve in order to go to the funeral home because of a situation. That was a sacrifice for me to leave my family. They didn't want me to go. It was dangerous for me to go, but I still had to go. And God provided and God protected. It was well worth it. Well worth it. Thirdly, God looks for our dedication to Him to be capable of being used. He wants to be able to use us. Number four, He wants it to be understandable. What I mean by that is, others who see what we are doing ought to be able to understand why we are doing what we are doing. We're doing it not for self-praise or self-honor, not to look good in someone's eyes, but to look good in His eyes and be pleasing unto Him. And I think most people who view us as we live our lives for Christ and they know how dedicated we are to the Lord, understand what we do when we do whatever it is that we do that we feel led of the Lord that we are to do at that time. Finally, God loves for our dedication to Him to be complete, all-inclusive, no limitations, no requirements put upon Him. He just wants our dedication to be complete. Everything about us is included in our dedication to the Lord. Let's note some examples, thirdly, then, of real dedication. I'm going to cover these very, very quickly, not keep you long. We're out of time. Humanly speaking, such examples as pursuing and achieving an educational degree, being a model employee for our employer, or building a house and bring it to, uh, to completion, those are great examples. Now, I've lived those examples but let's focus on examples that are given to us in God's precious word. 
biblical accounts. Think with me about these, and I'm just going to reel them off for you. But think about the lad who gave up his, his lunch that he had with him on that day when Jesus was teaching, and he came to hear him, and he had five barley loaves and two little fishes, and that's all he had. And being a young lad, I expect he's like most young boys that I know of these days, and young men, they can eat a barrel full. He probably thought, man, this is not hardly enough for me, and yet the master asked for it. Anybody have any food here? And the little boy said, well, I've got five loaves and two fishes. Jesus said, will you let me have it? Yeah, you let, I'll give it to you, Lord. He fed all of that multitude of people, and then they took up 12 basketfuls afterwards. How about that? That's what dedication that's the blessings of dedication. That's what it will do. What about the poor widow who gave all she had in Luke chapter 21? She didn't have anything else left, and she gave it all to the Lord. That's full dedication, right? What about Noah building the ark in uh, Genesis chapter 6? 120 years he was in building the ark, according to what the Bible says. What if he had stopped it when he 50 years into the process? But no, he didn't stop. God told him, Noah, build this ark. And here's the dimensions. This is how I want you to build it. And Noah persisted and he stuck to the task. And year after year after year, he continued to build and persevere. And people were coming by and saying, what in the world do you think you're doing? Can you imagine what they were saying as they scoffed and made fun of him? It's never rained, Noah. And you're talking about rain that's going to cause this big vessel right here to float? Where in the world is your mind? And yet God had told him, build the ark. He built the ark. He remained dedicated to the cause. You know the story. Finally, I must mention our Lord Jesus Christ. As he traveled the Via Dolorosa, and the cross was put upon his back. He dedicated himself to you and me to go all the way to the top of Golgotha's brow and there offer himself a ransom. Give his life so that you and me could have life. Die the death that you and me should have died. Pay for the sin that you and I should have paid for. But he was dedicated to doing all of that for you and me. He gave his all when he gave himself for us on the cross. Galatians 2 verse 20 says, For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me fully dedicated to the task at hand to set me free. When he asked of, of me to be dedicated unto him, is he asking too much? Not at all. When he asked of you to be dedicated to him, is he asking too much? Not at all. What do we need to take away from this lesson here this morning? Well, real quickly, let me say this. One of the reasons that many lack power with God is because there's a lack of genuine dedication that comes forth from one's heart to the Lord. Most people are good at giving lip service to God, but so many lack when it comes to serving Him with a wholehearted degree of service, giving their all. We must never forget, beloved friends, that God wants our love and service for Him to be rooted in the affections of our heart. We love Him so much that we do not want to disappoint Him and we give ourselves fully, totally, and completely to Him. God desires for you and me to demonstrate dedication to Him with vigor and with freshness, eagerness and warmth that rejoices because we have the privilege of being able to do that. 
He does not want you and me to be half-hearted about our dedication to Him. He does not want you and me to say, well, Lord, I'll give you the scraps of what I've got left over if there's anything left over after I've done all that I want to do. He's not looking for the scraps of my life, nor is He looking for the scraps of your life. He is looking for the very best from each and every one of us. Why? Because He gave his very best for you and me on the cross. When we are dedicated to him with our whole heart, we experience a supernatural power that will enable us to live in ways that we just cannot believe that we live each and every day. As I close this morning, let me ask you, what do you assess your level of power with God to be today? I'm not asking for you to give me a number, but just to help you do that, I want this to be an internal assessment. If you were assessing on a scale of 1 to 10, what would you assess your level of dedication and your level of power with God because of your dedication to be? Only you can do that. If that level or that scale does not reveal a high level of dedication to God, today would be a really, really good time to just do as the people of Israel did and as Hezekiah did in Second Chronicles 29, rededicate yourself to the Lord and to His service. God will bless you. The flow of His power will be real in your life like you have never experienced before. And your life will be abundantly lived if you will dedicate yourself to Him. Father, thank You for our time together. Please use these remarks for Your honor and Your glory. To You be the praise given for all that is done, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together, please.